Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Johns Hopkins School of Education, Doctor of Education virtual webinar. My name is Sion John. I'm the Assistant Director of Admissions here at the Johns Hopkins School of Education. Also here with me, I have my colleague from the Office of Admissions, and she will introduce herself. Hello, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Tanya McMillan. I am an admissions coordinator here at the School of Education. Welcome and thank you for joining us today. Also presenting today, we have a student speaker from the EDD program, Tonio Wynn, and faculty lead of the Doctor of Education program, Dr. Laura Flores Shaw. And just a friendly reminder, today's webinar is being recorded. We will be able to share a link with you after the event is complete. There will be a Q&A session at the end of the presentation. Please type your question in the chat box and we will answer your questions. Next, I would like to share the agenda for today's presentation. We will kick off the presentation sharing an overview of the Johns Hopkins School of Education. Then Dr. Shaw will go over, go over the program details of the Doctor of Education program. We also, have, we also have a student speaker from the EDD program and he will talk about his journey at SOE. And lastly, we will cover admissions requirements and financial aid and leave the floor open for questions at the end. And to start, we are one of nine schools at Johns Hopkins University. We began offering college courses for teachers in 1909 and then became our own school in 2007. And we are proud to share that the Johns Hopkins School of Education is consistently ranked one of the top schools in education by the US News and World Report. And for school enrollment, we have approximately 1,741 students, and we offer 25 graduate programs, which includes our doctoral, master's, and graduate certificate programs. And we have a strong network of over 24,000 SOE alums. And for faculty introduction, Dr. Laura Flores Shaw is an assistant professor at the Johns Hopkins School of Education. Dr. Shaw received her Doctor of Education from the Johns Hopkins School of Education. Dr. Shaw is extensively trained in family systems therapy and educational neuroscience. She also has direct experience as head of school within an AMI-based Montessori school framework. Dr. Shaw's work has focused on translating research from multiple areas of neuroscience, educational psychology, sustainability education, and family systems research into school design and classroom practice. And at this time, I am going to hand the floor over to Dr. Shaw. Dr. Shaw will be presenting on the Doctor of Education program. Welcome. Well, thank you for that introduction. Hi, everyone. So glad um, to be here and to have you here and appreciate your interest in our program. So I'm gonna go over quickly the vision and uh, mission of our program. So the um, Hopkins School of Education program is designed to impact complex educational problems across the globe by preparing education practitioners to think critically about problems within their education environment and develop the deep understanding and insights to lead positive, sustained change within those educational contexts. Our mission is that exceptional education practitioners will engage with an internationally renowned faculty to cultivate and practice curiosity, critical discourse, and perspective taking in a unique and rigorous course of study using the lenses of social justice, systems thinking, appropriate research methods, and empirical inquiry. So the Doctor of Education degree is, ide is ideal for experienced practitioners who seek to analyze and critique educational practice and research from a social justice and systems perspective, who seek to apply relevant methodologies to address critical challenges in education, those who seek to integrate research and practice-based knowledge to develop research-informed decisions and opinions about educational experiences, processes, policies, and institutions. 
and those who seek to communicate effectively to diverse audiences about educational research experiences, processes, policies, and institutions. So at a glance, our program requires uh, a minimum of 90 graduate credits beyond the bachelor's degree. So the master's degree is required for this program. Master's degrees are typically 30 to 36 credits. Up to 36 credits can be transferred automatically with the potential for six additional credit hours uh, to be transferred in. A minimum of 48 credits must be completed here at Hopkins. For uh, fall 2023, we have areas of interest. Um, these four areas include entrepreneurial leadership and education, mind, brain, and teaching, instructional design and online teaching and learning, and urban leadership. One thing to note about our areas of interest is that uh, you are not required to take all of the courses within a particular area of interest, but you can actually choose courses from different areas um, in, a, in a bit of a choose your own adventure type of approach. And this really helps to foster uh, more of a systems perspective rather than siloing information within to a particular area. So we have opened up all of these er areas of interest uh, to all students. So as for some of our program features, um, this program is rigorous, relevant, and systemic and social justice, social justice perspectives are highlighted. Um, we allow students to communicate research and modalities other than scholarly writing. So this is something that a lot of other Doctor of Education programs do not do. Um, we do not privilege one form of communication over other forms, so students who wish to present their uh, research in video or um, audio form such as podcasts or a series of talks or something like that, that is also welcome. Um, it's a four-year program to allow for focus on process, really focusing on the process of research, the process of learning as opposed to just getting a product completed. Um, the uh, instruction is online and asynchronous. We do have synchronous support. And um, there is doctoral dossier work that you can do within your coursework. Uh, so on this slide, this lays out our curriculum structure. So we have uh, 15 credits of foundations of education courses. There's nine credits of applied research. So this is really looking at research methods. Um, and we have 12 credit hours of doctoral dossier research and 18 credit hours um, for areas of interest and other electives. So for the, for the curriculum structure, uh, at this point, the transition points uh, in, in the program include a comprehensive exam, so an oral exam um, following year two focused on core courses, uh, a proposal, um, actually there will be two proposals that will be defended orally for two different projects related to students' um, doctoral dossier research, and um, final defense for all of the research work done. So the final and most significant requirement um, for the EDD is the doctoral dossier. So um, this is a culmination of independently completed but closely interrelated projects projects related um, to a problem of practice that is of interest to you. And the projects are embedded within coursework and distributed across four years. So the program is four years. Um, there is a focus on a problem of practice within uh, your context of professional practice. 
Um, that could also be your specific context, the organization in which you work, or it could also just be the context of the larger field in which you are situated. Um, there is a potential for significant change within content of professional practice and or implications for policy. So the work that you do in this program, um, this doctoral work, really, we want it to uh, have real life implications uh, within your context, within your field, or potentially for policy. In terms of support structures, we have um, an online orientation that occurs uh, the summer before um, the fall semester. We do have a face-to-face -face orientation uh, yearly that is also a residency for continuing students. Um, we have uh, a faculty cohort lead, we have program mentors, there's peer mentoring, group advising, and of course instructors. We do have a wonderful writing clinic um, that has been a huge support to students. We have library webinars and um, we have online resources for the uh, program and cohort sites. So there is a mandatory online orientation. Um, at, right now, this is what this orientation looks like. This is subject to change, but essentially this is the orientation that accepted students will attend over the summer. Um, section one focuses on technology tools that can be used within the program. Um, section two is an introduction uh, to research, research um, methods uh, and so forth. Section three is library, and um, we have city training. There's a sec section on social justice and um, an EDD course tour. So this, again, is subject to change, but will, will occur uh, in the summer prior to the fall of 23. So as indicated, we do have an orientation um, slash residency that is in person every summer. Uh, actually, we did not have it during COVID, but we will have it in summer, this coming summer. So that is a face-to-face -face orientation that occurs in late July. It's generally two to three days. And it also can be completed electronically from a distance for those students who are unable to attend. So um, it's, it's not mandatory that you attend in person. Um, and then uh, the second and third year, it's residency for, for the continuing students. Um, so the point of this really is to allow um, program year specific learning to jumpstart students' work each year and allow for face-to-face -face interactions with faculty and other students. It's really just a nice time to come together to get some overview of the program, um, get some additional training, but to also come together and to be able to bond with your cohort, other cohorts, and with um, faculty. So some of the work that some of our past students have done are listed on the slide here. So we've had, um, we have a student look at uh, HIV AIDS infected young adults who are non-adherent with their medication. Um, <clears throat> we had a student look at education for diversity, how to ensure teacher success in reaching culturally and linguistically diverse populations. Um, another student was looking at entrepreneurship and Escribo, an ed tech company in Brazil. Um, advisement models to support community college student enrollment and completion has been another area of study. Business and education partnerships, uh, models of endurance, and qualitative exploration of pedagogical constructs in Montessori schools. And that last one is mine, actually. That's what I did. So now we're going to turn it over to our student, speak, uh, student speaker, Tonio Nguyen. 
Hello, everyone. Uh, thanks, Dr. Shaw. Um, I'm going to turn my camera on. Just, um, I think one of my intentions um, for my time here is just to humanize everything that Dr. Shaw just talked about. Um, I also just want to say hello to Victor in Colombia and Amy in New Mexico and Dimitri in Louisiana. I think that really demonstrates the diversity of the cohort, which to me is um, one of the best things about this program not only where people are coming from, but that people are rooted in their context. Um, so I, my name is Tony Nguyen, and um, I'm kind of between um, year two and year three of the EDD program. My uh, specialization is in mind, brain, and teaching. And um, my area of interest uh, started off as um, looking at the decolonization process for Alaska Native education. Um, and I forgot to mention, I'm, I'm based in um, Alaska. But as I've been going through this program, um, and this is one of the neat um, aspects of the process, which Dr. Shaw talked about, was how much um, how much self-learning you go through. Um, and so I've added this whole concept of, of like my own decolonization process of kind of understanding um, my own positionality as an educator, as a researcher. Um, so I like this duality of thinking about not only um, the system that I work in, but also how I interact with that system, which um, basically brings me to my problem of practice, which is looking at how um, educators can navigate both Alaska Native and non-Alaska Native ways of being, knowing, and learning, which basically is about um, holding two worldviews at once um, in our school systems. And it's just been a really great lens. I've really enjoyed um, using all the coursework to kind of again and again, just go back to this problem of practice. Um, and I think that's a really defining piece of the program is as you develop your problem of practice, you're always um, investigating it through all these different lenses. Um, Dr. Shaw talked about all the different coursework and not being siloed. So looking at it through multiple lenses has been really eye-opening for me. I think, you know, I, I loved hearing so far just the attributes of the program. Um, and to me, I'm just kind of what I'm sitting with in this moment is just being really, um, you know, the sense of pride and excitement about the program because um, everything that was described has been my experience. Um, specifically, um, two concepts. One is it being a practitioner-based program. So um, I am doing the work as I'm going along and as, 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 as everybody else in the program. So we're kind of um, have one hand in the research and the other hand kind of on the ground doing the work. And I think that holding both is really important to me and, and being a practitioner. The second aspect that I really appreciated is the focus on social justice. And when I think about that, it's just not social justice as an idea, but as a project. And that the school is working towards integrating that. And, and it's not easy, right? Like there's a lot of questions that arise and, and I just appreciate the program constantly going back and thinking about what does this mean in our program? What does it mean for our students? So I think those two aspects, um, and along with this, how the program is designed to facilitate both social justice and uh, a practitioner um, being in the field has been kind of my main reasons. Um, to take you to a moment, um, a moment that kind of highlights this for me, um, Dr. Shaw talked about um, multiple modalities and being able to represent our thinking in many different ways, not just in kind of a standard traditional, you know, dissertation, written dissertation. So I was in a, a course called Neurobiology of Learning Differences. And within this course, of course, we're, we're learning about all these different modalities. And I remember going to the professor and asking if I could do my final project by basically integrating my own way of thinking, which is very visual based um, and creating a project. So I ended up uh, creating kind of a history of the neurodiversity of movement through kind of an animated visual video that took the viewer through all of these different things. And I just, I think what really stands out to me about that moment was, A, not only did it match my own modality, 
but two, that it matched what we are learning in the course, this idea of um, not just basically practicing what we're learning about. And, and I just really appreciated that congruency. Um, and, and not to mention, like, even sitting here today, I still have in my body, like, and in my mind, like that learning, and it feels really, um, it just feels really good to be able to do that. Um, and then I think the last prompt that I was given was just um, tips. And um, I'm going to share with you just some gentle reminders I've been that have been serving me really well as I go through this program. And also that I remember thinking about when I was um, kind of discerning my own process. Um, the first one is um, my th first gentle reminder is just about intentions. And I, for, what I've been reminding myself again and again is that this is really my process. Um, and that Johns Hopkins and all the professors and the and my cohort members are partners in that process. And I think having a clear North Star um, about why you're doing the program and what you hope to accomplish and your purpose has really served me well in kind of navigating, not only deciding on this program, but also continuing to navigate through the coursework. So number one, the first gentle reminder was just intentions. Um, the second reminder is, and this is important being kind of a distance program, is um, connections and relationship form the foundation for everything. Um, and so connecting with cohort members from all over the world, connecting with professors and building those relationships have served me really well and just really deepened um, my learning as I've gone along. And I, I think sometimes it's easy in these programs to be to be solo or, or isolated or busy, but I think going again and again back to those connections has really served me well. And then finally, um, my last gentle reminder, and, and this is one for everyone on the call today, is just to celebrate um, as you go along. I think often <laughs> the road that this journey can be long and um, the navigation can be complex. And I think even just celebrating being on this call and discerning a doctoral program is a call for celebration, just being on that path. I remember when I first started this journey, um, it took a lot of conviction and resources and energy just to begin this process. So I hope you can take a moment today just to celebrate um, being on this path. And uh, I think that's what I have to share. I, I hope that I was able to humanize a little bit this program that I'm really grateful to be a part of. Thank you so much, Tonio, and also Dr. Shaw. So now we'll move on to application requirements uh, for the EDD program. Applicants must submit a completed application, which can be found on our school's website. Next, you will need an updated resume highlighting your educational and professional background. Also, your personal statement should not exceed more than 750 words and must describe a problem of practice relevant to your context of professional practice, your current context. Please be sure that you are aligning your problem of practice with one of the areas of interest. Moving on, you should also submit two letters of recommendation. Uh, these letters should include the following, a professor that you've worked with in your master's program who can speak on your competency to conduct rigorous scholarly work, and a professional recommender who can attest to your qualifications to pursue a doctorate degree. This recommender would support your problem of practice. Please keep in mind you that you must uh, submit two if you're not able to, excuse me, submit two professional references, uh, you can also, I'm sorry, let me back up there, excuse me. If you're not able to submit an academic reference, sometimes we do have students that have been out of school for some time, you can actually go ahead and submit two professional references in lieu of the academic one. Also, one final note, please ensure that your recommender uh, is also, one of your recommenders is an executive sponsor. This person should be someone who will be an asset in helping you to gain access to data and participants related to your problem of practice. Should you be self-employed, your executive sponsor might be a person of authority with the agency you would like to work with to collect your related data to earning your doctorate degree. Again, this executive sponsor 
must be identified and submitted with the application. Additionally, the GRE is not a requirement for admissions to our EDD program. It is optional for an applicant to submit a GRE test score as part of the application. However, submitting a test score is an opportunity for you to present additional evidence of the quantitative and verbal skills required for doctoral level study. For official transcripts, we do need all official transcripts, including institutions. You may have taken courses, but did not earn a degree. Lastly, all applicants will be asked to complete a virtual interview upon submitting their application. And Dr. Shaw, we do receive a good amount of questions and admissions relating to the problem of practice and executive sponsor role. In addition to what I just shared, please feel free to share any additional information or reminders that you have on the problem of practice and executive sponsor. Yes, so and I'm, now I'm gonna turn my video on because last, last time I couldn't, so this time I didn't try. <laughs> but thanks, Tonio, for making it known that I could do that. Um, with, with respect to a problem of practice, uh, you, you really want to keep in mind that we are interested um, in hearing about a problem, not a solution. And uh, I say that because most students actually um, write and they, they will come into the program even thinking about a solution without having really clearly defined a problem. Now we will help you with that, but it's good to start your thinking ahead of time in terms of what are issues that I'm seeing within my context and actually think about um, observable behaviors. Uh, and don't think in terms of what you think the solution is or what you think the cause of it is, um, but to actually think about, well, what is the problem? Um, so, you know, as an example, we had a student who thought that professional development was a problem in his context. Um, and when I asked that student, uh, well, what is professional development the actual problem or is it a factor that may contribute to a problem in some way? And uh, he said, no, I think it's the problem. And I said, well, what, what, do, um, what do you think, what would happen if you had better professional development? And his response was, well, uh, teachers would be better at uh, managing the classroom, which was not a response that I was expecting. So that's a very, so, okay, so that, that's an interesting problem to, to consider. So, so teachers, if, if teachers were better at managing students in the classroom, then what would happen? And then he started talking about, well, then students would be uh, engaging in more creative problem solving practices and they would um, uh, they they would have time for um, more collaboration and he started talking about what were essentially what are essentially 21st century skills so through that conversation we determined that his problem was really more about implementation of 21st century skills within classrooms as opposed to professional development which is one way of training teachers to do that but it's just a factor. So we don't, again, we don't expect you to have your problem fully outlined, defined. That is, that is a process, and that is a process that will occur um, particularly throughout the first year of the program, but at least initially when you're thinking about a problem of practice, think in terms of problem, not solution, and ask yourself, is the problem that I'm stating, does it have an inherent solution within it? So um, that's some some other background around the problem of practice. Um, was there a, now was I supposed to address something else as well? Was Perhaps it if you had any um, insight into the executive sponsor role that you could share. Right. Okay. So the executive sponsor role. This is really more about you know if if you plan on conducting research within your context that you have support from uh, whoever is in charge of that context to support that research. If you are the owner of your own business, um, in fact, we got an inquiry um, just today from a, from a student who owns their own business and doesn't have an executive sponsor. They are the executive sponsor. Well, they would be their own executive sponsor, but in that instance, obviously, you're not going to write a recommendation letter for yourself, so you'll have to find somebody else to write a recommendation letter and make it clear that um, that 
you're, you, you know, if you're nominating yourself as the executive sponsor, because you are the owner, that that's, you know, you're, you're getting a recommendation letter from somebody else. Thank you. And also, oh, oh, sorry, ahead. one more thing, just also, the executive sponsor is also not somebody that shapes your research in any way. So I want to make that really clear. Again, they're just supportive of whatever work that you want to do within the context. But it's not, a, it's not assumed that, that that sponsor is ensuring, for instance, also that your, your tuition is being paid. That's a separate issue. Um, but they also don't get to determine what your problem of practice is and the type of research that you're going to do. Thank you again, Dr. Shaw. So moving on now to our admissions timeline. The ED application is currently open for fall 2023 admission. You will be able to find the online application on our school's website. The application deadline is January 18th, 2023. Applications will be reviewed from February to mid-March of 2023, and admissions decisions will be released via email in mid-March 2023. For international students, there are a few additional steps you'll need to take in order to complete the application process. Non-US citizens from countries where English is not the official language are required to submit one of the following standardized tests as part of the admissions application process. A waiver for the English language proficiency requirement may be granted for some applicants who meet specific criteria. Information on the English language testing waiver can be found on the school's website under the International Student Admissions page. Also, please note if you do hold qualifying degrees or have earned credits from institutions outside of the United States, you must have your academic records evaluated by an accredited independent credential evaluation agency before you can be considered for admission to the EDD program. Again, information on the course by course evaluation process can be found on our school's website under the International Students Admissions page. Here on this slide, we have a breakdown of the tuition and fees for the next three years. We will be sending this chart and a thank you email with the recorded video within one week after the event is complete. The tuition for the upcoming academic school year will be 1720 per credit. So for a three credit course, the cost is 5160. We encourage you to view our tuition and fees page on our website for the most up-to-date information about tuition and fees for the program, so you can understand the complete picture of the cost associated with becoming a student here at the Johns Hopkins School of Education. If you're interested in applying for financial aid, we strongly encourage you to apply for financial aid when you start your application. The EDD program offers scholarships that range from approximately $500 to $3,000 per semester. Students do not need to apply for these program-based scholarships. The EDD partial scholarships are merit-based and are awarded to select students by the EDD admissions committee. In addition to the merit-based scholarships, the School of Education offers a limited number of partial need-based scholarships each year as well. The SOE and Dow Scholarship Awards are applied to tuition expenses beginning in the fall semester. To see if you qualify to apply for the endowed scholarship, please visit the Grants and Scholarships page on the school's website. And of course, if you have questions about financial aid, you can find financial aid on our website as well in the financial aid section. Well, thank you all so much for attending our Doctor of Education program presentation today. At this time, we would like to open up the floor for questions. Uh, please definitely type any questions you have in the Q&A box and we will respond to your questions. So uh, there's a question here uh, that I see, um, could a student opt into a dissertation instead of a collection of projects? So. Um, Yes, 
although you may want to ask yourself why you want to opt into a dissertation, because another option could be that actually you would use your projects to prepare papers to be published in peer reviewed journals. And I will tell you that if you're interested in getting um, you know, working in higher education, that's actually going to be more meaningful um, to potential employers later on than a dissertation. So um, if, if somebody, it, it's not that we have a dissertation track per se, but it would be that you would choose to do your projects um, in a scholarly writing um, modality, and um, you would make sure that there was just coherence amongst uh, the, you know, your projects in terms of um, the flow uh, and so forth. So that's definitely uh, an option. Uh, let's see. Um, oops. Uh, let's see. Uh, what are some of the positions recent graduates going to with this degree type? Um, so one thing to kind of understand about this degree, it's it's also um, it's it's not necessarily that you you have to determine for yourself what it is that you want to do with this degree. We have a lot of students who actually don't come into this program with a, a specific job at the end of it in mind. Um, we have uh, a lot of students who come into this program. Um, for the learning. And actually, that's why I came into the program. I had zero idea that I was going to actually work in higher education. Uh, and uh, I certainly didn't have it on my bingo card that I was going to be um, running the program. So, uh, you know, it's, it's, uh, it, but we have had students who had where their jobs have actually created positions. Um, and or where they've gone on and done consulting or where they they do a lot of things. We've had also, you know, folks transition to higher ed and start teaching at teaching universities and that sort of thing. But um, Antonio, do, do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, I, I just agree with you. I think, you know, I think, you know, some of the cohort members have this really direct track as far as what they hope to do. But I think a lot of them, I, I, I feel like a lot of them are here because they're interested in just diving deep into their, their passion or problem of practice. And what emerges from that is actually new pathways that many of us never even considered before, <laughs> before this. And so I, I think that's part of the process. Yeah, definitely. Um, I see we have uh, a question, let's see, about time commitment. So, Tonio, you're, you're in the program. <laughs> That's such a, um, such a good question and a really hard one to answer. Um, yeah, I've, I've been asked that so many times. And I think I think first the first thing that comes to mind is you you get really good at um, managing time and focusing on things that matter um, both within the program and in other parts of life. So you, I think you just get very clear on what your priorities are. Um, at the same time, um, so for example, I'll, I can share with you. I'm a very slow reader, and um, I've had to develop ways and strategies to you know not spend. 30 hours a week reading through articles and 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 so you I think you just get you get really good at managing your time and what that looks like for each individual looks really different. I know some people work full weeks and then they devote their weekends right and and that can be really and then some other people wake up early other people stay up late at night. Um, but I think I think on average being able to devote a few hours a day. Um, is a really helpful way to think about it, um, whether it piles on at the weekend or you're able to shrink, sprinkle it in through the week. Okay, thank you, Tonio. We have another question about um, if someone has started uh, at another doctorate program. Honestly, we have not moved folks into our program who have come from other programs. I think it would sort of depend on uh, how, how far along you were in the other program. 
and the types of courses. So um, especially uh, with the way that, well, the changes that we, we are making to our program that we've described um, with the use of other modalities and so forth. So it's, and it's very, very, very process oriented. So I think it, 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 it's just gonna depend on uh, each person's situation. I, I can speak to that, Dr. Shaw, because I was in a previous doctoral program, and I, the, to your point about it being process oriented, I, I still would have wanted to go through all the coursework that I've gone through because each course, it's not so much about the content of the course, but how it integrates into your problem practice. Thank you. I had forgotten that you had, yeah. <laughs> okay. There's a, a question from Stacy about um, online technology and how it mediates learning and builds relationships. Yes, so uh, we, let's see, where is that question, Stacy? Oh, sorry, I need to read the question. Okay. Yeah. Well, I can start by telling Stacy that they, the program is using Canvas as one of the, the main platforms for organizing all the coursework. Um, and then in addition to that, I think every cohort and groups in the program find other mediums for, and you know, whether it's, you know, using WhatsApp or Facebook or um, for, for, I can, I can speak from my own example. I, I'm not on a lot of social media, but I do meet very regularly with a small cohort of, of members to check in and kind of provide that kind of relationship and support. Um, so everybody finds their own way through it. They kind of adapt as needed. Yeah, and then we, we of course, as a program, we use Zoom and we do um, host Zoom sessions for whole cohorts uh, for, for folks to come together. So we, we do what we can to ensure that connection is being maintained um, in, you know, in different ways. Uh, so Deanna asked about the expectation that you, of completing research at the current job. So, uh, no, not, not necessarily. So you can do research, um, uh, also in your field, or if you change jobs, like if you're in project one, you do research at, you know, that's relevant to your current context for project two, you could do. Uh, research relevant to your new context, um, or you may just do research on the field in general. So um, that's one of the nice things about the changes that we have made is that people's uh, journey does not get disrupted, really, if they end up changing jobs. There's a question from Chao about if the schedule is flexible to accommodate full-time employees. Um, and I can say from my experience, um, that's one of the most magical parts of this program is that it, there's a lot of flexibility as far, I mean, I think, I don't know anybody who is not working full-time. Um, and so there's a lot of ways to kind of create a schedule that works for you. And, and um, my experience with all the professors, they also acknowledge that. And there's a lot of, um, again, the, the focus is on on the learning and the process, not so much these clear defined, um, you know, other, yeah, sometimes other things get in the way of that process. So yeah, there's a lot of flexibility, I would say. Uh, Shelly asked if it's possible to move to a different country or a different workplace. Yes, it is possible. We've had students do both. Okay, so somebody is, so it looks like, uh, is asking about neuroeducation components and um, is this focused in a specialty or integrated throughout? So the mind-brain teaching area of focus is that specific area of focus, although there are components that end up in some of the other courses, um, but mostly that information is within the mind-brain teaching courses. Dr. Shaw, there's a few questions about um, the executive sponsor. Sherry asks, if I own an education consulting company and an assistant principal, am I an executive sponsor? Yeah, if, if you own your own company, you're gonna end up being your executive sponsor. <laughs> 
uh, essentially. So again, you would not be providing a recommendation from an executive sponsor. Obviously in that case, you would find somebody else to write a letter of recommendation for you. Uh, okay. Is it recommended to reach out to faculty to build relationships during the admissions process? Um, no, actually, I would say that it's not, not during the admissions process because we, we would, that would be, I, and I just say that not, not to be that we don't want to have interaction with folks. It's just that um, we get hundreds and hundreds of applications. And if everyone were to reach out to faculty, um, I think that that would just be, it, it would be very tough on faculty once, once you, once you are a student here, though, you're always welcome to reach out to faculty, even if you haven't had them as an instructor yet and you're interested in their in their research. Um, so Nellie asked, is it possible to be able to publish resources while still doing my studies? I mean, that is possible. So as I was saying, if you wanted to do your two main projects as scholarly writing and you wanted to prepare those papers for publication in peer-reviewed journals, you could submit them um, during the course of the program. There's a there's a question about um, when do classes meet? Um, and there's kind of a combination, in my experience, there's been a combination. Sometimes um, you meet with professors online and you have face-to-face, -face. Uh, like for example, tomorrow I, ha I have a, a, you know, a session for my final research project. Um, we'll all meet together and discuss and talk. Other times, um, yesterday I met one-on-one -on -one with my professor. Um, other times I just meet with uh, classmates and work on projects together. So there's like a, I, back to that, kind of question about flexibility, there's a lot of different versions of what class looks like. And if you if you can't make a session, for example, they're recorded and you can and you can um, watch them at your own leisure as well. So very flexible. Yes, and then and also there's others, there are other ways of um, participating. So for instance, in my courses, I, I, I like to hold salons, which, which are basically synchronous discussions. Um, the majority of students come to those. Those are not recorded just to give space uh, to folks, but we actually do have, like we keep a padlet of all of the points made, but then folks who can't attend will actually participate uh, in the discussion via Flipgrid. Uh, so, um, so everyone can have a chance to participate and also to know what other points were made, uh, even though they didn't get to attend the, the live discussion. Um, Karen asked, can we, can you have a combined area of interest? Yes, that's the whole, that's the, what we're exactly what we're talking about. So areas of interest, um, though we're asking you kind of for one main one uh, right now, you can take courses from any area of interest. And again, this is hugely important to foster a, a more uh, complexity systems perspective of things, right? So if you're doing um, online teaching and learning, for instance, you actually really need to know something about how humans uh, learn and also from an embodied kind of perspective as well, how humans interact with objects, you know, and affordances and within the environment, like thinking about things from that perspective can inform like how you might design something. Um, so um, you do not have to stay within a particular area of interest. Dr. Shaw, can I give an example of that from my own context? Sure. So I'm in the mind, brain, and learning, and I'm very much rooted in thinking about different ways of knowing and how cognitive structures, you know, process information. Um, so that's where I'm rooted. And for example, there's a course in developing professional learning, which is really important to me as well, because that's might be one modality that I engage with my community of practice. So I think I, I again that goes back to the the value of this program is is having a systems approach and being able to have that flexibility. Someone also asked to clarify: Do we do we meet for class virtually? So I just want to be clear: This is an asynchronous program, but there are synchronous components. You do not have to attend synchronous components, at, at least all synchronous components. Um, when you're doing your proposal defense, you do need to attend that. <laughs> but otherwise, 
um, this is an asynchronous program. So we, we do try to provide, again, opportunities for us to meet synchronously so that you can feel connected. It just also enriches the learning experience. Uh, so we try to provide um, different times for things. Dr. Shah, there's a few questions about, um, uh, so Keith and Nasheen ask about the four-year completion timeline and or how did the program land on four years instead of three? Yeah, so basically three years, uh, it's it's just a, a lot in three years, a lot. Um, and uh, what we have been finding is that students have not typically been graduating in four years. So, um, and now with the, the model that we have, uh, or sorry, they weren't graduating three years, they will graduate in four years on time with their cohort. Um, also, it's not the case uh, that you'll take courses every summer. So in the, in, with a four-year program, we, uh, you will take two courses the first year in the fall, two courses in the spring, and then you'll have the summer off. Uh, then you'll come back. Um, and that following summer, you'll, you'll take one elective. Um, so we, we try to spread it out to make it um, less stressful and more doable for students and to really, again, give time for that process. So having that first summer off is really nice because you know, there, there's a lot of doing in the program, but we also want time for reflection, like some real deep reflection and some thinking, some, some also time to step away from things for a little bit, because when you come back to them, there's a bit of a different perspective and, and you can, you can go deeper into uh, your thinking and, and how you're looking at your problem practice. So we're really trying to, to honor uh, process as much as possible. Um, yeah, somebody I, asked for the percentage of students who finish. It. I don't have those answers off the top of the, those stats on the off the top of my head. Um, students who who finish in in three years versus four years. And, I, and Dr. Shaw, I just wanted to um, amplify what you just said there um, with the four year focus with built in time for processing and space to really go deep and think and. You know, I think a lot of my cohort members who were doing it in a shorter period of time re regret that because they didn't have that breathing space to, um, and I'm, I'm listening to them say, I can't wait to go back to these things versus this idea of, of doing them throughout the process. So I think it's, again, it's kind of building in that congruency with what we know about learning and having space to process and not just focusing on the product. We have a, another question about the problem of practice. So, so again, problem of practice is a problem, an issue that you see within your context, whatever context that is. So um, you, you want to uh, ask yourself, what issues am I seeing? And you want to be focusing on the problem as opposed to thinking about a solution. So, so um, a lot of times students will think about solutions, but what is it that you're seeing? So maybe you're seeing issues around student engagement. Um, so, you know, ask yourself, well, if they were more engaged, what, what was it that you want to see? Like, what is it that you want the outcome to be? Um, so remember, you you all you can also you know a problem of practice is common. This is a common term for this degree. You can always Google and see what other people write about problems of practice um, and how to develop a problem of practice. Um, Kurt asked a really great question. Um, if anything took took us by surprise. I, I really like this question. I can say, um, I'm going to first, I'll answer for myself, but one of the most common things that I hear from my cohort members is um, how much self-learning goes on throughout this process, like unpacking your own 
self as instrument and how you engage with your and how much you learn about yourself going through each of these um, courses. So I would say that definitely rises to the top. The other one is how much unlearning I've done. So how many, how much of letting go what I thought, like, for example, what Dr. Shaw mentioned, you think that you know the answer and then it's like, woof, I really didn't know. Like now that I have the systems analysis, I'm like, you can let go and go in different directions. And so, you know, Dr. Shaw talked about how many times you iterate on your problem of practice. And it's just like, what how I think today is nothing like how I thought two years ago. Uh, someone asked about potential career outcomes in the mind brain teaching area of interest. So I, I you know, we actually we don't track that kind of information um, of our students. So I, I think it's really important, though, that you do that research and figure out because uh, if, if it's not just mind-brain teaching in the general field, they call it mind-brain education. So, you know, what do, what do folks do with that? And, but also you have to keep in mind that it's, um, you know, like anything else, this is a, a journey, you know, life is a journey. And so if you feel compelled to um, go on, this journey, this kind of particular journey, you may not know exactly what will be the outcome of it, but it will lead you somewhere. And the question is, are you truly deeply compelled to do it? Uh, I, th I think that's really sort of th the guide. I know that it's, it's very pragmatic to think, well, what is my return on investment going to be? What kind of salary will I make? What job will I have? And I completely understand that. Uh, but at the same time, um, I, I think it's, it's, you know, possibilities open up to us when we do the things that we are compelled to do and uh, new pathways, uh, as Antonio said earlier, they, they appear. So um, I would just keep that in mind, but just see where that's a very personal decision. So you have to see where you're at with that. Uh, just one more question before we close here. So what areas of interest would be most relevant for or commonly explored by educators of English as a second um, slash foreign language? I mean, honestly, I could see any, uh, particularly uh, mind-brain teaching. We have a lot of folks um, who take mind-brain teaching courses um, uh, who are ESL folks and um, urban teachers, I could see, I could even see leadership, you know, just leadership is also about, you know, understanding um, the folks that you're guiding <laughs> and leading. So, so I think it, it just, it depends on also your interest and where, how you're viewing your particular problem within your context. And, um, you know, I think the important thing is to be open, to be open to the idea that something that may not seem immediately as relevant to your problem could actually be incredibly relevant because again, the world is complex. So you could be opened up to a very different part of the system that you hadn't even considered. And that's extremely important if we want to really change things. Uh, you know, particularly in education, we really need to look at different parts of the system so that we can break down existing structures and create new ones. Very well said. I love that last part that you just talked about, Dr. Shaw. Thanks. All right, thank you, Dr. Shaw. And thank you so much, Tonia, for being here and for the wonderful presentation today. So we are out of time. And here on this slide, we have some important contact information. If you have any questions, admissions related questions, excuse me, please reach out to my colleague, Tonya McMillan. Any EDD program related questions, please reach out to Rachel Gibbons and her email address is on this slide. Thank you so much for your interest in the Johns Hopkins School of Education. We look forward to hearing from you. Good night, everyone.